We're going to introduce William Mogaya. So, uh, the big question on everybody's mind is how do we bridge the gap between the understanding and the implementation of blockchain technology? People in this room don't have a problem in the understanding because this is what you are here about. You are very interested in the blockchain. You understand it very well. But the problem is that the masses, the masses at, at large, still do not understand what the blockchain is all about. And every one of us here has a responsibility to spread the word, to tell your friends, to tell your business associates. Everybody needs to understand the blockchain. Wherever I go, I ask people if they've heard about the blockchain. And in more cases than none, they have not heard of the blockchain. But when I say, how about Bitcoin? And they say, yeah, Bitcoin. And I say, well, that's the technology behind the uh, that's behind Bitcoin. And then I start to explain it as much as I can. What's important is to, for us to bridge uh, the gap between understanding and implementation. We have to increase the level of understanding and we have to also increase the sophistication of the implementations that we are seeing. Currently, uh, a lot of the activity is really in the core development area. The balance is tilted towards there. And even at this conference, in overall, the discussions are dominated by discussions about the core technology that the blockchain brings us. The heroes and the heroes of the blockchain today are people like Vitalik Buterin, Peter Todd, Gavin Wood, and others. They are all working on infrastructure. They are all working on core development. But this is where we are today. However, in the future, I think we're going to be focused more on application development. It is not there yet, but I am looking forward to the day where applications are going to be dominating, not just infrastructure. This is a slide that I've been using for 20 years. I use the same slide for the internet because it's generic. It's the same thing. When the internet came along, we started with the internet itself, which was infrastructure, and then a bunch of middleware came along, which was the web, really, and then applications took off. So the same thing is happening with the blockchain. Most of the activity today is in the infrastructure, the core protocol, everything to do with that is really infrastructure. It's getting it ready. So the infrastructure has to be there as a starting point. And then we want to write applications, but the middleware is needed to write applications because the middleware is going to make the infrastructure more accessible. So this is really where we are. So my focus is going to be more on the application side. Let me start by asking you a question. Um, what does the blockchain disrupt mostly and primarily if you're a developer? Uh, I'm not talking business-wise. Business-wise, they're going to say all kinds of things it's going to disrupt for sure. As a developer, what do you think the blockchain disrupts mostly? You're all developers. Most of you are. What is the one thing that we're all very used to? We were all used to it. You couldn't write an application without what? before the blockchain, the database, the database. All the applications have something to do with the database. When you write an application, you rely on the database. So the one thing that the blockchain disrupts, that's a very important one, is the database. Any applications today relies on databases. The database is not getting replaced. It is getting the the application has changed so that the blockchain now takes a piece of that database. If you're in the enterprise right now, a lot of the pilots start with the blockchain. But as soon as you want to implement something end to end, then it's not blockchain anymore. Half, if not more, of a large project in a big enterprise is about integration. It's about integration with the existing systems that all rely on databases. So it's very important to keep in mind in the future that blockchains have to learn how to interact with the existing databases because databases are not going away. It's the blockchains that are the newcomers and they are the alternate way to write applications. But in many cases, you also need to interact with the database. So my talk is focused on th seven themes I'm gonna talk to you about that have to do with the future of writing distributed, decentralized applications. The first one is, Cryptocurrency, of course, that's the first application 
of the blockchain and Bitcoin is one of them, but think about cryptocurrency, not just in the movement of money. Think about cryptocurrency in the development of many financial instruments, derivatives, assets, stocks, bonds, commodities, everything that is currently happening in the financial services world. All of the assets that we currently trade, whether it's on the NASDAQ or the CAC or any, any exchange, any stock exchange is running today, not on the blockchain. But in the future, a large portion of these assets will be transacted upon on the blockchain. So think about cryptocurrency not just as a currency, but think of it as assets, financial assets that now can be traded and will be traded in a variety of forms. So as complex as the whole stock exchange system is, the same variety would be expected coming out of blockchain applications. I'll give you an example. One example is a company out of London called Clearmatics. They are developing a decentralized clearing network for the over-the-counter derivatives, but running entirely on the blockchain. So they will start with zero customers, and they will bring buyers and sellers into it. And we can expect to see many more such types of networks. The second application that you hear a lot about, especially in the enterprise space, uh, I was in Brooklyn last week at the Enterprise Ethereum uh, Alliance. Uh, I'm also a board advisor to Ethereum, as you all know, and I'm very involved with uh, what the enterprise uh, space that Ethereum is doing. And this is really what a lot of the banks have latched on to. So the blockchain is more than distributed ledger technology, but especially the banks uh, and big companies, they saw the blockchain and they were a little bit scared because part of the blockchain is Bitcoin. And for the banks, they are not allowed to trade Bitcoin because Bitcoin runs on a public network. Banks, by regulation, have to trade on private networks, on pr networks that they own partially or that they have controls on, over. And Bitcoin is the to total opposite of that. So when they saw the blockchain, they said, oh, they started to decide, they, like, they took what they like and they rejected what they don't like. So this is kind of like this. So the blockchain entered the enterprise. It was this strange, uh, this strange uh, bird, and, and then uh, experienced denial, anger, bargaining, def depression, acceptance, and finally stuffing. And they said, okay, we're gonna settle on distributed ledger technology. And that's what we like, we understand it. It's about programming a spreadsheet. And what it's going to do is not going to disrupt our business. It's going to help us save money. It's going to help us improve some processes, make things faster, better, cheaper. But that's, not sh that's fine. I'm not criticizing the banks or the big companies for doing that. They can be busy for the next 10 years implementing distributed ledger technology to reduce costs and speed up processes. It's naturally fine. The whole financial network is running on proprietary networks. It's like a spaghetti of networks where the clearing and settlement delay could be up to three days. And what does it, why does it have to be this way? It's because there are so many people in the middle, a lot of intermediaries in the middle, and the blockchain promises to collapse all of that. Three, proof of X. And I think it was mentioned uh, with Peter earlier, it was one of the questions. There's gonna be a lot of businesses that will consist of proving something. Because the blockchain is a great record keeping platform. When you write something on the blockchain, that's it. It's there for eternity. You cannot change it. You cannot tamper with it. It's cryptographically secure. So I'll cover this in the book. There's this table where I kind of categorized it into three levels. There's a proof in a consensus, which is where the blockchain infrastructure is, and we hear about this proof of work, proof of stake, proof of authority, and so on. But then move this up to the business side. We have proof as a service. We're gonna have proofing things as a service. And we're gonna have proofs in existing services. So the land registry, instead of going to the municipality, to the city, and checking it, we'll be able to check this on the blockchain. 
Today, we Google for everything, right? You want to find information, you Google for information. In the future, we're going to go and the world will not be Google. It will be something else. We're going to go blockchain check. We're going to check things on blockchains. So I wrote uh, an article last May. Uh, at why I said the, the title was uh, The Blockchain is the Next Google. And the next day, I got a call from Google. And they invited me to come and talk to them and explain what I was talking about. But eventually, there will be maybe many Googles. Maybe it's not just one Google that will be the place where we go and check things. Maybe it will be many of them. And any, any of you that are startups or thinking about opportunities, there is businesses in all of these types of segments to prove information. Decentralized protocols. That's another area that does not talked about a lot. I'll give you three examples. There are many examples, but I'll give you just three. Uh, this is kind of the idea of building a protocol on top of the blockchain protocol that already exists. So these are like vertical protocols or horizontal protocols, specialized protocols that are on top. And one example is I'm involved with them. Open Bazaar is a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer commerce protocol, which is going to allow anybody to, in, to do business, to do commerce with anybody else in the world. So this is like eBay without eBay. And this one is built on Bitcoin. Another one, 0x, maybe you haven't heard about it, it's fairly new. It's a decentralized protocol for exchanging the ERC-20 tokens. ERC-20 is the, is the uh, standard for uh, Ethereum-based tokens. And it's becoming the most popular and commonly used method to generate tokens. So they are coming up with a protocol to do this without a smart contract natively. That's very interesting. And then another one, Definity, is doing a decentralized cloud computing which, uh, a protocol which is going to extend, it's going to extend the Ethereum virtual machine. So this is a, an example of extending the cloud that already exists, but going further. So I give you an example of bit on Bitcoin, two examples on Ethereum, because they are the most popular platforms. How many of you are on the Bitcoin side here? Okay, and how many are on the Ethereum side? Yeah, I, a little bit more Ethereum than Bitcoin. So I don't know if you saw my my uh, presentation at EdCon three weeks ago. What, if if Ethereum was a car, what kind of car do you think it would be? A cool car. What's a cool car that doesn't use ah, Tesla? Well, hello. So this is how this is how Ethereum sees itself. Now. This is how Ethereum sees Bitcoin. <laughs> this is how Bitcoin sees Ethereum. <laughs> <laughs> so many people I talk to that are Bitcoiners, when I talk to them about Ethereum, they say, oh no, it's not gonna work. And, and, but in reality, uh, this is where Ethereum is, really. Well, see, the car is, is in color and it's not black and white anymore. It's going fast, it's starting to move. And you notice the gas tank here? This is, let's keep moving. Token-based models. It's a very, it's a very important uh, aspect of blockchains. And tokens uh, are not just to do ICOs, initial cryptocurrency offerings. Think about this vision. The coins in your pockets and the money in your bank may soon be replaced by tokens in your smartphone and in the applications that you use on a daily basis. The applications that we use are getting tokenized. There's gonna be more and more tokens that are part of applications because there is a new system of work that is emerging where you may be doing work that is either passive or active Maybe I'm giving data to an application and they're giving me tokens back. Maybe it's my healthcare data. Maybe it's data about me driving or something about a habit that I have. But what if I was given tokens that are valuable in return for me giving data? What if I was given tokens for my time, like my attention? There is a company called Steemit. If you publish content, you earn tokens. If somebody upvotes your content, you earn tokens. 
If somebody republishes it, you own token. So they are monetizing attention. If Facebook was created in the day of the blockchain, we should all be compensated for our attention. Because Facebook, if you think about it, they make their money because we are giving them an hour of our time every day. But we don't get paid for it. But in the blockchain model, there will be models where everybody is an owner. Everybody has a token. Everybody participates in the wealth creation of the business. And we're going to see a lot of examples in this particular sector. Actually, I am organizing a specific summit in New York in May. For one day, we're just going to discuss token-based models. Not the technology, but the application of it. And not just ICOs, but all the business model innovation that the tokens are enabling. And this is really the next frontier of the blockchain that I'm very focused on in terms of understanding, researching, and writing about. Yes, I mentioned initial cryptocurrency offerings, and we cannot talk about the blockchain today without talking about ICOs. It seems to have become a preferred way of raising money. And I issued some warning that, well, let's not get too excited, because the ICO is the beginning. It's the beginning of the journey of a startup. A successful ICO does not mean that the ICO is a success. It's only the beginning, because an ICO the company behind it is just like, an, like any startup. And startup, 90% of them don't succeed, unfortunately. But the 5 or 10% that succeed do very well. So keep that in mind that we have to see ICOs as a great way to raise money, but your work starts really when you raise the money. Uh, last year, about um, 64 companies raised $100 million. As of the middle of February, 34 companies had already stated their intention to raise money via an ICO or had already done it. At the pace it's going at, I predicted that there will be 300 ICOs this year, raising, raising $600 million. 80% of them are on Ethereum. So Ethereum is already getting some network effect on the ICO because of the ERC-20 standard. So this is why it's so important to have standards. Standards mean more adoption. It's easier if standards get adopted. And there will be billions of tokens. Already it's very difficult to track them right now. Smart contracts, I think, is very underrated right now. Uh, we're just barely scratching the surface of smart contracts. I'd like to see a point where smart contracts can be developed by business people, where you can come in on a template and put in your rules, and then the smart contract is generated. Because smart contract is, what is smart contract? Be besides giving it a technical definition, it's just business logic. But with the blockchain, it is not just business logic. It's business and money logic. So it's a series of if this, then that. But there has to be money involved. Because if there's no money, then it's called business programming language. Nothing new there. It's been around for a while. But the blockchain brings this currency into it. It means if I do a bet with somebody and I put a Bitcoin, let's say, to bet that tomorrow it's going to rain or it's not going to rain, automatically, as soon as the weather happens, if it rains or it doesn't rain, either, either I lose the money or I gain the money. It's all part of the contract. So there's no way to change it. I wrote about this uh, a month ago and I said, well, maybe, maybe the blockchain is like the internet, and it's waiting for its web. If you think about it, the internet started very technical. If you had to get on the internet in, in before 93, you had to know something about computers, about connecting them to a network. And then the web came in as this layer of standards, HTTP, HTML, and the likes. And it enabled us to really understand the internet in non-technical terms. So we can just deal with information instead of just dealing with connecting networks. So at the abstract level, if you re remove the word blockchain from the title, these are some of the generic functions that a blockchain does. At the nucleus is the records of value, because it's really about value. Either you have value in this 
little field, or you don't. But and then there is balances, there is time stamping, security transfers, there is a notion of assets, there is a notion of ownership, who owns what. And then beyond that, there is proof, settlements, verification, movements. All, all of the blockchain is, at the end, is going to be APIs, programming interfaces to these kinds of functions. But we're not there yet. I would love to see that happen more progressively. And in the same way that the internet and the web have a stack of standards, I just came up with this generically. It may not be exactly the way it happens, but the blockchain relies on the internet, right? So we're not gonna change that. The blockchain goes on top, and the functions I showed you before are here. Then there's the trust-related interactions, and then the users, they will be br browsers now. Uh, there are at least two of them, maybe, maybe a third one that I, I know maybe not announced yet. Uh, that are going to be blockchain browsers. So you'll be able to just get on the blockchain via a very familiar interface. And that's going to be a very good thing for mass adoption and mass understanding. So we're waiting for that to happen. The next phase of the blockchain is not going to be dominated by technical and technological discussions. It is going to be really about business again. It's going to be about innovation, it's going to be about end user applications. Many of these applications, the users will not even know that there is a blockchain behind the scenes. And that's what we should be looking forward to, is seeing more and more of those. I recently um, announced that I'm putting together a whole directory of Ethereum activity. I called it ethereumall.com. And I'm seeing more and more applications here. And this is everything to do with Ethereum in terms of core technology services and around it. And there's close to 400 types of activities around Ethereum. I did a similar thing for Bitcoin two years ago and there were, there were 500 companies. So now I'm mapping the Ethereum ecosystem as my next project. You can follow it at Ethereum All, or if you are part of it, go and enter your activity or claim it if it's already there. The end state, in closing, so where are we going? If you look out two, three years from now, what is going to happen? I broke it down into three different levels because you have to think that the blockchain is really operating at three levels. There is a technical level, there is a business level, and there is a legal level. At the technical level, as I said initially, it's really the database that's getting disrupted all the way. And the day that Oracle enters the blockchain will be very important and turning moment for the blockchain. So far, as you, as you know, they have not done anything yet on it, or at least they have not stated anything yet, because they control most of the databases. I mean, Microsoft has been very aggressive from a different perspective, from a services perspective, and that's been a very good thing for the uh, ecosystem. But the blockchain is going to get disrupted, and we're gonna see more virtual machine environments. Ethereum runs on a virtual machine, so you'll be able to just open up a consensus node without even knowing anything technology-wise. So the cloud is getting expanded with multiple functions. It is not just a cloud for computing. It's a, it's a cloud for trust. It's a cloud for blockchain applications where you can prove things and verify things. So the meaning of the cloud is expanding. Tokens are going to be the killer app, in my opinion. But what's more important is the business models that they are enabling. And that is where the innovation is going to be. How does a token enhance a business model? How does it create something new that did not exist before? And how do we get to critical mass to network effects with tokens? That's we're only at the beginning of this. Finally, I think smart contracts are going to be the next robots. And we're not even close to being there yet. And there will be something equivalent to Googling 2.0. We're not going to be Googling for information. We're going to be checking for proving things that happened, whether they are ownerships, assets, movements, transfers. Anything that has to do with business will be able to be on the blockchain. So thank you very much.